Hey everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, the Richard's talk, I think, right before this, if some of you were in there, was was a was an amazing kind of intro to what we want to share. Um, we want to sort of dive into oh, a little uh, dive into um, uh, more about user experience. So we want to take uh, some of the a couple of the use cases that we've been working on uh, over the last uh, eighteen months or so, and walk you through case studies of of what our thought process was behind. Um, sort of uh, making a mass market oriented product and some of the challenges we ran into. Um, Richard showed like this, this F1, you know, cockpit uh, steering wheel and, uh, you know, we came up with a, a labyrinth basically. Um, so basically, you know, you know, you think of navigating crypto user experience and, you know, it's a lot of, you know, Googling, looking up YouTube videos, copy and pasting, long strings of passwords. And uh, you're never sure if you're 100% going to make it out, right? Uh, you, you might make a little bit of a mistake. You might send something to the wrong address. Um, it's not really the, the ideal that we're, we're looking for. Um, but if we look at you know, the, the, the market itself, um, we pulled this chart from uh, Andreessen Horowitz, who I think got this data from Nansen. Uh, but active address is actually you know, on the rise, and they're steadily growing. So you see uh, last month, uh, there were about 17 million wallet, uh, active wallet addresses, uh, which might seem like a lot, um, but we sort of took that, and if you compare that to some of the monthly average user numbers um, from popular brands, uh, you'll see the, you know, this little chart down here is all of crypto right here. So this little pink uh, chart of 17 million users compared to uh, some of these larger brands is, is quite a small drop in the bucket. Um, and I think we all want crypto uh, to be, you know, as ubiquitous as a, you know, Spotify or Uber or, or Amazon or Telegram. Um, so that's to say, I think the, the danger is we still have a long way to go. Uh, we're still, I would say, in the innovator early adopter phase. And um, we've got this sort of big, you know, what they call the chasm or this gap. We have this big chasm to, to, to cross. Um, so how do we get it past this chasm? How do we get not stuck in the, you know, the left side of this, this chart uh, of, of the early market? Um, well, one, I think, uh, barrier is, is use cases. So I think people don't understand what crypto is for. So if you ask the average mainstream user you know, about crypto, they think of the currency part of things instead of the, the crypto side of things. Um, so they think about farming yield and airdrops and, um, and getting new tokens, uh, but they don't think about, and this was a great thread by, by Corn Telegraph, uh, they don't think about all the, the really great underlying benefits uh, of crypto, so transparency, you know, decentralized immutability, uh, and real true peer-to-peer -peer, uh, interactions. Um, so we're both uh, product designers uh, by background. We're not developers. Um, so you know, Steve Jobs is like the the you know the ultimate product designer. Um, so he had a great quote where he talked about working backwards from the user experience and back towards the technology, and not from the technology you know to inventing user experiences. Uh, so our you know opinion is that the user experience is really the biggest barrier um, to mass adoption. We have this incredible, incredible technology, um, but what does it mean to have a great product? Cool. Um, thanks, Lynn. Yeah, so really quickly about, about us. Um, this is our team. I think the thing that we really wanted to point out with this slide is we're all very old. So we've, <laughs> been, uh, we've been around <laughs> for a long time. We've worked for a lot of kind of well-known uh, Web2 companies. Uh, I think w with regards to crypto, I think we spent a bunch of time at Square, so we come from very traditional fintech, and um, it's, I think we have a unique appreciation for a lot of problems that actually Web3 solves because we had worked in traditional uh, fintech and we understand kind of limitations there. So I want to kind of fly you through what we've built and maybe share some learnings along the way, but very, very quickly. So um, what we're focused on is, first of all, not a Web3 product, uh, uh, you know, that's not the pitch. Um, so we're very focused on the use case. The use case is to build um, products and services for small homeowners, so people that own one or two piece of real estate. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, real estate as an asset class, the largest asset class in the world. Um, this is actually globally, so I think 217 trillion. Uh, in the world, which is, by comparison, many people don't know this, but bonds, stocks, Bonds like 90 trillion, stocks is 70 trillion. Um, 
you know, it's uh, it, it, it real estate's bigger than 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 both bonds and stocks combined. And so for us, it's like the you know, our focus was at real world assets, like real world use cases. Real estate felt like the right area to tackle with these new kind of Web three technologies. So what are we focused on again? As individuals, small homeowners, vast majority of real estate, I think around the world, but in the U.S. in particular, is actually still owned by individual people. I just buy one house and then maybe rent out a house down the road, but institutions are, are encroaching on it. So you've probably seen these kind of headlines around the fact that big companies like BlackRock, Blackstone are going up there buying um, a lot of single family homes and, and uh, selling, basically renting it back to uh, the individuals. And we like this idea and it kind of dates back to our Square days as well where we build products for small businesses that kind of like, okay, what, what is it that the big guys have that the, the little guys don't? And institutional in investors, you know, they have the tools, right? They have access to a really good real estate data so they can make really good decisions. They have access to lawyers and legal contracts. They have access to capital, right? These are really important things. So the reason we love Web3 is it's meant to solve all of these things, right? You have, you know, oracles, you know, obviously chain links. We love chain link because it's a, it's a way to democratize data, right? Smart contracts effectively could replace lawyers and be global. Um, and of course, global payment rails. Again, having built products that just do payments in the US, trying to get out of the US is very, very difficult. And you know, fundamentally, we think you know, this is one of the biggest use cases that actually has the potential to create a global economy, including for real estate. So um, what's the first step? We've got to network real estate. I'm going to get into this. is going to be kind of controversial. Um, a lot of people have tried to do this. I'll share our approach. So you know, how do you bring real world assets on chain? Um, you effectively have to do a Tron type thing, <laughs> which is you kind of have to zap them, and they have to be available on chain. Uh, we've actually come up with a model that's kind of different than the standard approach. So if you guys are familiar with real-world assets, this is what happens usually. So you have a real-world asset, let's take a house, and you want to NFT the house, right? That, everyone's heard about this. Um, so what you do is you, you, you uh, re have to recapital, you have to buy the asset um, kind of all over again. You have to convert this asset to an uh, LLC. The LLC can, take, can be wrapped inside of an NFT basically illegally, um, the whole process takes weeks, um, and you know, if somebody steals the NFT, technically right now they would steal your house. So I think everyone, if you're in Web 2, you, sorry, Web 3, you've, you've heard of all these problems. We really focused on this. We, again, going back to Richard's talk, like that's not, that is not a process you can unleash on the consumer. Like there's no way, right? You can't tell people that they have to create a bunch of, um, a bunch of acronyms. And so our approach is actually like much more, um, I think, much, much friendlier. So what we do is we actually, uh, instead of sinking to, uh, uh, um, instead, of, instead of recapitalizing the asset, essentially, we just sync with real estate databases in the US. All information about real estate and ownership is at the county level. So we actually have very old school databases. Think of it like mainframe computers. What our product actually does is synchronizes with those databases, keeps that information um, in sync. We actually can generate an NFT and, uh, on the end, but the NFT basically just represents data that lives in the county. No need to recapitalize all of those things, and no need to change ownership. Process takes minutes. Can't steal the asset. I'm just going to fly through it. This is a product we built. It's called Property App. It's live today. You guys can check it out. If you own a piece of property in the US, you can actually go through the whole thing. It starts with an address. You search for your house. We do an IDV process where we verify you actually you, and we check that against government databases. You get a dashboard, shows you a value of your stuff. We actually generate an NFT and the wallet, but it's abstracted <laughs> per Richard. I'd love actually to get Richard's kind of marks on, on where, we, where we are, uh, um, you know, in, in terms of his uh, thresholds. But um, you can save it as an Apple wallet pass, which is something people understand kind of better than saving something to a wallet. Um, and then what that unleashes is effectively all these really interesting use cases. Now that the asset is online, think of it as like an Uber driver, Uber cars online. What can you do now? Well, you can you know, uh, rent it out, you can do all these things. So rent, sell, borrow, share, invest is now possible because this asset represents digitally on chain, um, globally, of course, and I gotta run. So I'm gonna fly through another product we built. Uh, and again, we don't have time for questions, but if you guys have questions, please uh, ping us afterwards. Yeah. So one of the, the use cases that we first ran into um, that, that would be easy to open up for a homeowner is, is um, a lot of homeowners rent out uh, their home, uh, essentially. So we've built um, RentApp, and this is another app that, that's available uh, for homeowners. Uh, you can go, go see it at rent.app. Um, and almost everyone has either rented out a home or have rented a home, right? Um, so we approach this project like, how would you make renting um, better? How do we make a better connection between homeowners and renters or landlords and, and renters? 
and does having it on chain and does does crypto make it better? Because um, I think that's the the ultimate question. Is like let's not build this just to be on chain. Let's make it so that it's fundamentally a better experience. Um, so you might ask, you know, how do you do that today? You know, why wouldn't you just take uh, some ETH or some Bitcoin and you know I get your wallet address and I just send you um, you know ETH or Bitcoin directly? Um, and obviously, I think you know that's that's you know that's in the real world that would be like paying your your and a lot of people do this that would be like paying your your uh, landlord with you know an envelope of cash or you know writing them a check. Um, it's not great. It works, um, but there's no context for the current transaction. There's no history that's recorded. Um, you don't know why. You know, if you need to go back, you know, 12 months from now or a year from now and try to find out. You know, what was this transaction for? There's no official record of, okay, this was for rent for October for this particular address. Um, and it doesn't build any kind of reputation or, or uh, credit for the renter or the landlord. Um, so what we wanted to do is really look at, you know, can we wrap this payment uh, transaction, this, this, this instrument essentially, uh, between the renter and the landlord? Can we essentially form that as a, uh, as a contract? Um, so what we've done is you, the renter starts with a search, like an address search. So they, they pick what address they're renting at. Um, then they send um, the landlord some money. Um, that gets notified. Uh, the landlord gets notified by email or SMS. That gets wrapped into essentially a, a smart contract. Um, and then as the owner, as the, 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 the landlord of the place, um, I can upgrade that into a digital title uh, property app. Um, so we're essentially taking an end-to-end -end, um, use case from needing to pay rent all the way to claiming digital title uh, from the renter to the landlord. Um, so I'd love to take you uh, through uh, some of the examples, uh, or, or just a quick UI. Um, but really, we thought you know this would be a really great, you know, it's essentially a better way to to rent. Um, and you know, we're working on. Um, building out some of these additional use cases. Uh, so, for example, you can have uh, the renter and landlord building um, a, uh, a, a transaction history. So, as a renter, you can go to another place that you're renting and you sort of permissionless, permissionlessly can show, oh, I've completed you know, 10 on time rent payments at a previous address, and the new landlord can take that data and, and trust that it's uh, valid. Um, Similarly, as a, as a landlord, you can take your transaction history and you might be able to go to a, uh, a DeFi provider or a bank and show, hey, I've uh, collected you know, 24 months of income for this rental property and be able to take a loan against uh, that particular asset. Um, so a quick um, run through of what this looks like. Uh, so we wanted to make uh, the whole process you know, feel like a Web2 product. So if you come in here, this might look like you know, PayPal or Venmo or Square Cash. You come in and enter in. I've entered in my address here, uh, the rental amount. Um, I can enter in my landlord's. It's hard to see here, but you can enter in your landlord's email address. One decision that we made is most people don't want to be exchanging um, um, wallet addresses because there's just long, you know, long strings and they're prone to mistakes. So e email is much more familiar way to uh, communicate that to you know, communicate uh, addresses to each other. Um, so you can enter an email. Uh, we made it so that you can do recurring payments because you want to set up your rent once. Um, and what happens is, is as the renter is filling this out, he's actually defining the terms of this lease, right? So you've got the, um, the address, the amount, when it needs to be paid, you know, who the uh, payment's going to. Um, and then they basically hit send and uh, their rent is all scheduled. On the landlord side, uh, what we've done is they get an email saying, hey, Andrew wants to send you rent. It's for $1,200 for this particular location. And we make it easy for the landlord to just enter their wallet address or connect their wallet to receive the payment. Um, so we're sort of disintermediating the, you know, the necessity of the renter knowing the landlord's wallet address or vice versa. Um, the renter could just pay anyone um, um, and hopefully any landlord uh, of their choice. Uh, actually, we're just going to skip these. Um, so let's go into yeah. what's missing here. 
Yeah, so, I mean, just some lessons learned. Again, we can talk about this for a long time. But this is, um, so Rent, Rent App right now is available globally. So if you go to Rent.app, um, if you're actually accessing from, from Spain, you'll see it's, it, it defaults to a global product, which is um, USDC, USDT based. And you can pay and collect rent anywhere in the world. Uh, in the US, it's actually a fiat product. So also kind of like try, try, trying to, uh, uh, you know, follow trends uh, uh, across the world. But if you're in the U.S., you can actually pay using U.S. dollars you, by linking a bank account. We also, in the U.S., have an app you can download. So global product, um, some interesting findings, because that's been live for about a, about a month now. But um, onboarding um, is still... So we don't handle creation of wallets. Uh, we assume on both sides you have wallets, because that was kind of the MVP of the product. But certainly, I mean, onboarding, generally speaking, I think renters, you know, people understand stable coins. Landlords tend to be older, tend to be much more conservative. And so off ramps are really, really important. Um, and that needs to, that process just needs to be way, way simpler, where it feels like you're just adding a bank account. You're not thinking of transferring all of these, um, all of these different, uh, you know, currencies. I mean, we're struggling right now with, you know, Polygon. We really like Polygon, but like, you know, the process is, hey, we support USDT, USDC on Polygon. Like, just doesn't make sense to anyone, right? Like, the, we have to type in all these FAQs to explain to him why that's cheaper. And if effectively boils down to it's cheaper. And effectively, you want a UI that just says, you know, do it fast and, 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 and cheap, or do, you, it's, do it, you know, slowly and because you're, you don't want to create a different type of wallet. So that, that whole space right now is really rough with, with L2s. Um, Identity is like you know trying to figure out easy ways to um, uh, you know to identify yourself to the extent that you want to. Um, you know, right now it's a fairly anonymous product, which has some downsides. Um, you know, lots of lots of stuff needed. Again, kind of crypto ramps. Uh, actually, uh, crypto ramps. Like, there's a lot of crypto ramps. The problem is that. Um, it's really expensive. So for a rent product, and that applies to a lot of like big use cases, one percent tends to be the cost. And coming from like traditional fintech, one percent is like an obscene amount of money to spend on a transaction. And in rent around the world, rent is considered to be free. People aren't willing to pay a buck to pay rent. And so it, basically anything over a thousand dollars, rent being a prime example, it's just a non-starter. What we have today, the off-ramps and on-ramps, the cost is prohibitive. You can't build anything. You're better off building using traditional rails. Um, oh, sorry. I go back. Did I miss something there? Yeah, I think we'll cover it. Yeah, me messaging. Yeah. yeah, I think I'll. Uh, yeah, we can wrap it up here. Then what do I have here? What did What did you want to say with this slide? That was it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, get out of this labyrinth. Um, um, yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you guys again. Uh, both products are live. We'd love to get your thoughts. Please use them again. Property dot app, uh, rent dot app. Um, check them out. They're slightly different if you're in the U.S. versus uh, globally. We're on Twitter, um, Telegram, email. Please, uh, um, yeah, okay. let us know what you think. Thanks. Cool. Thank you.